kind of pre-announced it a little bit to the press so that you know people would know and people would want to come. Um, so uh, today uh, I'm going to talk, uh, just start off talking about the history of Loft Crack and you know sort of how do we end up where we where we where we are today. Um, Loft Crack's been around for 12 years, um, which is it's interesting with security products uh, that last that long. It means the problem problem really hasn't gone away, right? So we still have this problem with passwords in general, password quality in general, and um, the, the legacy of Microsoft's um, backwards compatibility um, is, still, is, still, is still with us. And uh, you know, that's a sort of benefit in a problem for Microsoft that they're, they've been so popular 10 years ago that they're still living with code, um, that they're just end of lifing now. I think uh, NT was just end of life last year. And um, of course, Windows 2000 is still um, pretty popular um, out there in the marketplace. Uh, my, uh, my dad uh, works at GE, and I was shocked when GE's standard image last year for <coughs> laptops was a Windows 2000 machine. That's a pretty big company. It's a lot of laptops all running on Windows 2000. Um, so it's still, st still out there. So um, Lovecraft 1 was released in uh, 1997. Uh, full 12, 12, almost exactly 12 years ago. We'll be coming up with it next month. And um, the first version was really just a proof of concept. The idea was um, PW Dump was out there. Um, was that Jeremy, Jeremy Allison wrote that? Uh, yeah. Jeremy Allison from, um, is that the SM, S Samba project? Is that where he's from? Yeah. So um, Jeremy was in part of the Samba project. Um, was working on you know compatibility with authentication, and he wrote this tool PW Dump that dumped the uh, the, the password hashes, um, and this really was this this is really uh, the, this was the this, 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 the critical thing that happened was as soon as we had those password hashes, then people started to say, well, how do we crack it? Before before this happened in early '97, no one even thought about Microsoft passwords really. Um, it was just sort of you know, people knew about Unix passwords. People knew how you could crack them. People knew that if you had a strong one, it was going to take a long time to, to, to crack them. Uh, and people just f assumed, you know, Microsoft was using DES. They're using MD4. There was just an assumption that it was secure. But as soon as Jeremy Allison was able to dump the hashes, people said, well, let's implement a cracker for, for these hashes. And uh, this is when uh, Mudge, who unfortunately can't be here today, started looking at, you know, how do I implement a cracker? Um, for, uh, for, for these password hashes. And as we started to look at it more and more, we said, wait a minute, there's all kinds of implementation problems with, uh, with the way that Microsoft is, is storing this landman hash as you know, all uppercase uh, in two chunks of seven, so you don't have to brute force anything more than seven characters long. And, um, and we realized that it's going to be trivial to um, do dictionary attacks and brute forces on this. So, as a proof of concept, Lovecraft 1.0 came out really as just a proof of concept. We had no idea that we were ever going to, um, to turn into a product. It was just, let's show how easy it is to crack passwords. And this was back in the loft days. This was the whole thing you want to demonstrate, demonstrate the problem so people will fix it. Um, so Microsoft pretty quickly realized that this was, this was a big problem that had to be fixed. Um, Microsoft's solution was to add another layer of encryption on top of the, um, the SAM, which was storing the hashes, and they came out with the syskey, which was, let's obfuscate some other key somewhere um, that's going to take a long time for people to figure out where this key is, um, and we'll, we'll put another layer of encryption on top of it. You know, as a security guy, you say, well, this is just a totally horrible solution, right? Eventually, someone's going to reverse engineer how to get that key. They'll decrypt it, and we'll be back to where we started from. Uh, Microsoft thought ahead and said, but you can put the key on a floppy, and when you boot the machine, then you can take that floppy out, and it's going to be really hard now. It'll be in memory, but it'll be even harder to find this key, and, it'll only be a, and if the machine is shut down, you can't find the key. Well, this is totally unworkable. Who's going to stick a floppy in their machine every time they, they boot it? You know, it just, it's just ridiculous. So I don't, I don't ever even heard of anyone even doing this. But it was one of these things where they said, oh, we have a solution to the problem. Um, so eventually, someone came out with a, a dumping utility that you know, worked on syskey machines. 
Um, that happened pretty quickly. Um, and so we got into this thing where there was all these little, the tools were coming out um, to sniff hashes as they went over the wire, um, dump hashes from uh, different scenarios. Um, and we said, you know what, let's take all these little disparate pieces of tools together and incorporate them all into Lovecrack. And this is where we started to actually say, this is, like, this is a product now um, because we're actually building in functionality. It's not a proof of concept anymore. We're actually making it easy for a system administrator to crack passwords. And that's really when Lof Lofcrack 1.5 was born. Um, it only took us about four months, but this was sort of the, the, the next chasm. This was like, now it's going to be a product. And we said, OK, well, this has value to system administrators. It's not just a proof of concept, because if there's weak passwords being used, they should find out about them. This is, this is you know, before there was pass filter, there was any kind of uh, password quality checking um, out there. Um, so we came with Lovecraft 1.5, and we said, let's, let's put a shareware license on it. You know, shareware was kind of big in the late 90s. That, I don't think anyone uses that term anymore. But uh, we said, we'll put a shareware license on it. We'll put a license on it and say, if you're a corporation or the government and you're using this in a for-profit um, you know, way, you're, you're, you're a legitimate business and all that, well, you should send us $50. Um, and uh, so it was just a shareware license. It was just you know, you know, the, uh, the, the license that comes with the tool. You could download it for free and very popular. We had a lot of downloads. Um, can anyone guess how many, how many organizations paid us $50 um, for Lovecraft 1.5? One. You must have heard the story. So one organization. So in, in a whole, um, let's see, it was about, it's about six months from 97, uh, 797 to 298, six, seven months. One organization uh, paid us. It was the Government Accounting Office. The Government Accounting Office, which I'm sure is a, you know, has billions and billions of dollars of budget, um, bought one copy for $50, one copy. And that was the only copy we sold. So we said, okay, we now have empirical data that shareware does not work. <laughs> um, because we're pretty sure more than one organization is using, using this product because we had you know, hundreds of thousands of downloads. So really, Lovecraft 2 was we said, all right, let's put in a license key mechanism. And let's see, uh, and, and you have to actually send us money before we send you the license key, and it will time out. And we just implemented the... the I mean, Mudge used to brag that it was so easy to crack that, you know, if you were the bad guy, you still got your free copy. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was, it, was really, it was really a very simple mechanism. And, of course, it showed up, you know, as a, free, as a, as a cracked uh, version on, on wares boards and things like that. Um, but the interesting thing was now all of a sudden we were selling hundreds of copies a month. So um, now we said, well, not only people are willing to download it, but they're willing to actually pay for it. So that was sort of 98 with version um, 2 was sort of the birth of commercial Lovecraft, and we started over time building, building features into it. Um, then in around 2000, um, the lofts got bought by At Stake, and uh, actually Lovecraft was, was sort of a separate, a separate thing. They didn't want to buy all of our intellectual property. Um, but we eventually ended up saying, okay, well, it makes sense to sell, sell off Cracked At Stake. And At Stake added a lot of features over time, um, support for rainbow tables, uh, support for dumping passwords from Unix systems, scheduling, so you could just automate, <coughs> automate the process. Um, remediation. Remediation, so you could just click, you know, uh, you could just say, all right, all these passwords that I cracked with a dictionary or with uh, brute force within a day or whatever your constraint was, you could just say, select all those, and you could say, okay, send pass force a password reset for all those, or lock out all these accounts. Um, so that, you know, the remediation. Um, and then in 2004, at stake up off by Symantec. And Lovecrack was actually generating revenue and uh, so they continued to sell it for a little while. And then they said, you know, this really doesn't fit into, doesn't really fit into our business. Um, 
Symantec really isn't a, you know, a, a security tool company. Um, it's more of a, you know, security infrastructure company, right? Let's put in gateways. Let's put in host agents. It's not a tool. They don't really have tools for, for auditing systems. And Nobody can picture Norton Crack. There was no Norton Crack. <laughs> so um, they end of life did. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a sad day for us because this was sort of our baby. And, you know, it was kind of interesting to see it move into these, you know, successfully larger companies. Um, and uh, when that happened, uh, we said, you know, is there any way that, you know, we could, a after about a year, we said, well, you know, there's got to be a way that we can get this technology back in our hands if they're not going to sell it. And so um, I, I, I began about a year ago the long effort of dealing with a large corporation with dozens of lawyers on staff. Um, <laughs> And uh, trying to figure out a way um, to uh, to purchase it back from them, so um, we did that, and uh, we did that about I don't know. Finally closed about a January, or something. January. Yeah. so it hasn't been that long. So we haven't had a lot of time to develop a lot of new features. So the idea really is to um, there's a screenshot of it. Um, the idea of it is um, to just get it get it get it available again. Uh, get it out on the market again as, as, as quickly as possible and bring it up to date with 64-bit uh, support because that's really been the thing that's lacking is it doesn't work on a 64-bit uh, machine. You can't dump. It doesn't work on Vista. It doesn't work on Vista, yeah. right? Um, so it doesn't work on Vista. It doesn't work on 64-bit um, XP. It doesn't work on 64-bit 2003 or sort of 2008. And it doesn't work on um, Windows 7. So... Um, Adding that support was really the first thing because we wanted to work on, on all those systems. And uh, just to over, over, overhaul the, uh, the UI, the UI was getting a little, little, little stale and not non vista -y. It looked like, it look, I think it looked very Windows 2000. Windows 95. <laughs> Windows 95. Um, so that's really the, um, the, uh, the push of the last couple months was just to bring it up to date uh, and, and get, it back on the mar get it back on the market so people... People, people can buy it. But now we have something that, you know, we can start to build on. Um, so we figured, um, you know, there's, there's other free tools out there. There's other commercial tools out there. We wanted to make it, you know, reasonably priced. And we don't like the notion of, like, you know, this one, you have the 10-account license and the 100-account license and the 500-account license. So we just simplified things. It's, um, you, you, can, you can use it to audit unlimited accounts, um, practically over 100,000 accounts. Um, last I checked, it really gets kind of slow. Well, yeah. Um, but, you know, who has a domain with 100,000 accounts oh. besides Microsoft, right? <laughs> um, you might want to break that up on the machines. Maybe, on the maybe the, uh, <laughs> the, the postal service or Walmart or something. I don't know if every employee has a domain uh, login. It's practical up to about, uh, about 10,000. <laughs> um, and so we used to have three different versions of it, um, and the, really the breakdown of the different versions is um, the, between pro and administrator. Administrator is really set up to be like an enterprise-wide for a domain admin to be able to um, dump hashes from uh, m multiple machines on a regularly scheduled basis, bring all those hashes uh, local and crack them, and then do some sort of remediation on them if you find uh, problems. So the, the pro is really um, meant for the sort of the small business that might have one domain, and the administrator is really meant for a large organization that has many domains or many different hosts with local, um, with local uh, they want to dump the, the passwords locally. And the consultant version is really meant for people who roam around and need to run this on uh, many, many different machines. They need to install it wherever they want. Um, so those are the those are basically three versions. Keep it keep it relatively simple. Um, so some of the future directions we wanna we wanna take um, Lovecrack in. We don't think that you know password cracking is 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 dead quite yet. As long as people are using passwords, cracking is always going to have some value. Um, and one of the things that I've been looking at over the last uh, last 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 couple of years is this idea of you know passfilt or other complexity, password, you know, complexity 
plugins aren't really complexity checkers. They don't actually check for the entropy that's in the password. Really, they just check a certain set of constraints, right? So if you tell someone that they need to use a capital letter and they need to use uh, a numeric in there, um, the idea of this person who's writing that constraint rule is saying, well, say it's an eight-character password. Well, if they just use lowercase alphas, I'm um, eight to the 26th um, combination. So, you know, that can be brute force pretty, pretty quickly. We don't use, we don't use encryption keys that are, uh, you know, um, eight, eight to the 26th key space, do we? Um, so that can be brute force really trivially, trivially. And the idea of the rule is, well, if I make them do capitals, I change my key space to 8 to the 52, and if I make them do numerics, it makes it 8 to the 62, and if I make them do a special symbol, you know, it's 8 to the 76, right? So that's great, right? 8 to the 76, I'm done. But the thing is, what the, what the human really does is, if you make them put in a capital and you make them put in a numeric, you end up with a password that's like capital P password 1, or capital C change me 1. Right, because you you met the constraint check, um, but to, but there's really very very little additional entropy between change me one and change me, because we 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 put in the rule we know how the human the human thinks right, so um, I so one of the things we want to do is you be able to put in what your uh, your proposed um, constraints are and see if they actually um, add, add, add some true uh, entropy um, to, 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 your, uh, to the passwords that you're putting in there. Um, and the more passwords we crack, the more we'll start to understand um, what passwords people end up using for certain constraints, right? So also in a, in a brute force capacity, um, uh, basically allowing uh, uh, uppercase, lowercase, symbols, numbers, it has a larger actual key space than something with plaques password complexity requirements. So if you were to brute force the whole thing and there were password complexity requirements, you wouldn't have to brute force all the simple passwords. You would only have to brute force the ones that met the complexity requirements. So it's actually reducing the key space if you do that. So uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily result in a faster crack, but the key space is smaller, so the theoretical limit of the amount of work you have to do actually shrinks if you implement that stuff. So, and the other thing we can do is once we understand what these, um, you know, what the rules people are using in common, we can make rainbow tables for, you know, we don't have to have a rainbow table of, uh, of uh, you know, eight to the, you know, seventy-sixth, uh, you know, complexity if we know that people are capitalizing the first letter and they're and they're doing, um, and they're just tacking on numbers and symbols on the end or replacing. So the rainbow tables can be much more compact and, uh, you know, fit, fit on a system, yet cover that whole, you know, 8 or 9 or 10 to the 76 power of key space. Yeah. Uh, the rainbow tables in the new version have been updated to be indexed and they support the latest uh, rainbow table stuff from the distributed rainbow table generation project and freerainbowtables.org. So you can actually just download a big old chunk of rainbow tables off the internet now as opposed to having to generate them yourself. Um, it's also faster because they're indexed um, rather than simply sorted. Um, and uh, you can get all kinds of different rainbow tables from land manager to NTLM. We now support a relatively wide breadth of different uh, shapes and sizes of those things. So. How many gigabytes of rainbow tables do you have now? I, I, I have almost filled up a terabyte drive of them, but that's... Uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of other stuff in there, like rainbow tables for WPA, which is actually pretty cool. Um, I'll talk about how that might work later someday, but anyway. Okay. Um, another future direction is the idea of um, password reuse within an organization. Um, I'd like to come up with a way to solve the password reuse problem across organizations, because if you're using the same password for your login at your place of business, and you're also using it for, um, you know, your brother's uh, blog that you administer for him on Linux running WordPress, um, that's, that's a big problem, right? Because if someone steals that password hash and cracks it, um, and then they can use that, every, you know, to log into your organization. Everyone's user, the usernames are all becoming 
um, the namespace is all becoming uh, your email address, right? So your most common email address is starting to become your username everywhere. So now if I find your find your uh, your password on one system, I can go and tr try you know that same username, um, which is probably your your email address because everyone's using that for password reset functionality um, across a huge amount of systems. Um, now, it's also potentially a problem within organizations, password reuse. I mean, how many, how many organizations have the same password on every desktop or every laptop, you know, some sort of uh, admin password or help, help desk password or some, there's some agent that needs to have a password to log in somewhere. And people use local accounts for this stuff. Um, and so there's a risk there if you're using local, local accounts um, with uh, reused passwords, that's a risk in your organization and it's a hidden risk because no one really you know, knows you know, what the other IT guy did one day when he installed this, it just sort of works. Um, so to be able to come in as a, you know, a IT security guy and find that risk by looking at uh, what are all the username and passwords used um, across all the local, um, the local uh, password hash stores on the boxes and correlate you know, what, what that commonality is. Um, so that, that's another potential future direction um, we're, we're, we're thinking about. We're looking at the uh, possibility of adding some wireless stuff as well. Um, doing uh, various forms of active uh, challenge response uh, analysis. So uh, specifically inje challenge injection. Uh, so if you have like an SMB request, somebody makes a, you know, Tree open, followed by here's a challenge. You spoof the challenge, say it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then they encrypt that challenge. It's a lot easier to crack that because you, the challenge is fixed. You feed it through a rainbow table and you're done. Uh, so that kind of thing, if you were willing to go active and inject, um, you can do a lot more uh, cracking. Uh, so taking a look at protocols that have that as a dubious feature, um, WPA is one of them. Um, so. Basically, cracking anything that you can fix the salt for. A challenge is like a salt. You know, you don't get to pick it usually, which is why it's complicated. So, if we can pick it, <laughs> then suddenly the hash is a lot more crackable. So, we're going to be looking at look at ways to be more active as well. So, um, I'm just wondering if anyone in the room has any you know feature that they've ever thought about that they'd want to see in a password cracker. They you know, they've, they've used other tools out there. Um, go ahead. Well, I was a feature, uh, the, an observation that you're mentioning the con password constraints lead to lower entropy. Mm -hmm. Another problem that uh, comes up that we've noticed is requiring users to change their password mm -hmm. negatively impacts the strength of uh, the password chosen. In that any employee who is asked to rotate their passwords uh, every 90 days, inevitably, after some number of years, will go to a scheme where it is mm -hmm. capital C, change me, one, two, three, four. And then after a while, and they get, you know, after they've done this for four or five years, then they start to use the year <laughs> and mm -hmm. month because. It's just too much trouble to remember all these different passwords. Mm -hmm. oh, sometimes Definitely. they'll stick a character on the front or on the end, like X. Yeah. It's always X. <laughs> or, you know, eventually, you know, there's only so much password history the system can store, so at some point they can start to wrap around again, right? If you're saving the last five passwords after, you know, password history, if it's only keeping five, when you get to the sixth year, you can go back to your first one again. Yeah, speaking so of that. So now you're in a cycle. You've, you've done... You, you're done cracking passwords for all eternity because now you know that it will always be in that cycle. Yeah, love crack, um, well, because these password histories have to get stored somewhere, they get stored alongside all the regular hashes. So love crack actually dumps all of the last five or ten passwords that you've had, not just the one you have currently, and cracks all of those. So uh, at least you'll get to see if they're doing the one, two, three, four, five, six thing. Um, we actually probably be, can be able to find a way of detecting that and saying, look, this guy's just rotating his password one character every time. You know, I want to talk to him about password policy or something like that. This could be done in an automated fashion. We fully intend to do that. 
Yeah. Kind of Yes. Off hours. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's a, there's a, uh, I, I, actually I haven't checked lately. <laughs> the scheduling features haven't changed uh, in a little while. It uses while, the window scheduler. But it uses the window scheduler for that and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I know, I know that it generates, uh, it generates a, a report on the screen. I, I, I have to check again. I'll, 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 I'll poke into the menu when we do the demo and we'll answer your question then. <laughs> I don't remember. The feature set is so huge, we can't even keep track of it. No, I just never, I actually never use the scheduling feature that much because I, I kind of have one, one or two machines, not like 100. So, I, you know, we have beta testers uh, who run this stuff on larger installations. And uh, we'll talk about beta. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a beta program going on, and we're going to be uh, getting, if you have a particularly interesting environment that would benefit. Uh, the, the project. If uh, we could get data from that, that would be cool. Um, then come talk to us after. Uh, anyway. Have you thought about adding a, uh, an NCP value determination on track to give them an NCP rating and then setting a threshold so that you can say, oh, we're going to be administrators that are following everything below this threshold? We, we, do, we do have that, okay. but it's not entropy. It's basically which how long did it take to crack? I mean, the problem right. is that w these are not, the pa passwords are not machine generated, right? They're human generated. So the idea of entropy doesn't really exist because it's what, it's what a, a human usually thinks of, right? A machine can generate any level of entropy that you want, but um, humans fall into patterns of picking passwords, so we can use those patterns to find them. It's not, uh, I don't know what to call it, but uh, I don't think entropy yeah. really is the, is the crack, right way to do it. Crack time is really the only useful metric because it's can, it's correct, how long can, can it last against a dedicated attacker? Right, so can an, can an adversary <laughs> coming up with rules that try to mirror human behavior, how long does it take them to crack it? Is, and so we need to come up with a, a word for that. Yeah. It needs to be, you know, point and click. It needs to be automated. It needs to be scheduled because when you're, when you're the good guy, you know, you have to, you know, check that all of the passwords are safe. When you're the attacker, you only need to crack one password. So the attack, you know, mechanism is, is very different. Um, you know, we're trying to aim this feature toward people trying to audit lots of passwords, not simply one or two. We've, we've thought about that. Um, there are some um, Perhaps the distributions version. out there right now um, mm -hmm. that you could get, you know, a, a, a boot disk that, that can, can, can do that. Um, but, yeah. you know, sort of in the Lovecraft spirit of things is like, you know, take those disparate tools and integrate it in together. So we, we, have, we have thought of, thought, of, thought of doing that. We've considered that also uh, for the purposes of doing uh, simply account recovery, like, oh, I forgot the admin password, stick this thing in there and have it just, you know, nuke the registry re remotely or, or, you know, you know, offline. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we've definitely considered that. There are a few uh, tools that people use in and around this space. One is like Peter Nordahl's boot disk, that thing that, you know, lets you use Linux to edit the registry for Windows. That's amazingly cool. Um, and we'll probably do something like that someday. And, uh, the USB, you know, key bootable environment uh, type thing is, um, you know, also been thought of. So yeah, it's considered. We'll see how much time we have. You know. <laughs> Sure. Um, well, you have a, if you have a hash uh, by itself, uh, you can usually log into resources and just use the hash. That's the that's just kind of how it is. If you can get the hash, generally, uh, you know you're not necessarily done, but you're you're uh, doing pretty good. 
Uh, that said, authentication isn't always centralized. Cracking a password is, you know, yours truly has had issues where, uh, you know, a, a bulletin board system or something happened to have a, a, a password on it that got cracked and then had up to be like the same thing as my email password, et cetera, et cetera, and you end up in zfo4.txt, you know, that, that kind of thing. So uh, the, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing across domain, you know, once you know what the passwords are that are being used, you have a better idea of how weak they are in general and, you know, uh, different hashes across uh, different machines uh, may use different hash, uh, may use different salts under Unix. Uh, so if you do crack it and then you, you know, just pass it through the next n number of salts for that user, suddenly you're going to find that he's using that password everywhere. Um, so uh, there, are, there are scenarios where knowing the exact password is valuable um, and it, th the casual uh, attacker may just sit down at a keyboard and type the word password as the password to see if that's the password and it usually it, that's that's as many times the password so you know there are there are sometimes you know you're gonna see sh shoulder surfers catch uh, you know someone typing dog one two three or the name of their, their their cat or something and because that they, they see that keystroke pattern they're like all right okay I know his password is now that that kind of thing uh, if you cause like password rotation and things like that, you know, you're going to be, you know, reducing the key space pretty quickly for the attacker, you know, so knowing something about how that people choose passwords is still beneficial, and if you know something about a single password, you may find out about a lot of the passwords. I mean, there's reducing risk across the board here. Well, there's also a whole other set of attacks mm. that you're doing, you know, passing the hash versus sort of acting as a legitimate user. Like, once you can compromise you know, say you're, you know, a, 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 an administrator gone bad, um, it might be easier for you to do certain attacks impersonating legitimate users without you putting any special tools on the system or compromising any system. So, I mean, I think the, you know, sophisticated attacker is going to want to be able to do both and, and pick and choose, you know, is there a host IDS, is there a network IDS, who's going to, who, what, what are the detections of different, um, uh, you know, different intrusions happening and sometimes logging in as a legitimate user is going to get audited and that's going to be detected. So you want to bypass that and do something, you know, under the covers, use a vulnerability. But other times using the vulnerability is going to get detected by an IDS and logging in as a legitimate user is not. So I, I think that, you know, it's definitely something an attacker is going to want to do, be able to do both if possible. Yeah. Um, and face it, the attacker, the first thing they're going to do they're going to sniff your network, then they're going to crack all the passwords, and then they're just going to use them everywhere. That's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's just the, the attack pattern. So, it is. Sure, it is straightforward. It's passive. It can be done offline, and they can usually get everything that they need to get without having done much more than simply dumping a bunch of hashes or listening to packets on the wire. You know, in the case of the sniffer, uh, one of the things we also got back from. Uh, uh, Symantec was the rights to the software anti-sniff, which is a technology that I wrote a while back um, that detects whether someone is sniffing on a network segment or not. Um, uses a number of techniques to tell if somebody's listening. It's an eavesdropping, a bug detector, if you will. Um, we're not sure the, of the future of that. Um, we may just stick it back up there and let people use it. Uh, but there is a library version of that that's available for people who are developing IDS technologies that are interested in being able to provide uh, passive sniff sniffing detection, um, you know, come talk to us. We have some software for you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that the last uh, two of the last big, um, uh, or, or at least uh, the TJX um, credit card data breach, um, they had um, installed a sniffer on the machine that um, basically got the, uh, the, the, uh, the credit card data sent to it in the clear. And the easiest way for them to collect the data, because it actually got encrypted once it was put in the database, was to just sniff, sniff on the wire. Um, so I think there's still a lot of rel relevance today to um, detecting sniffers on your network. It's just um, um, I, I, I don't know why any, no one else has come out with this sort of uh, you know technique, yeah. IDS yeah. technique. Um, so I think we. Next, uh, well, here's some uh, email addresses. We, uh, it's lovecrack.com is the uh, domain. 
And uh, if you uh, have any questions or, or are interested in purchasing it, you can send us email. It'll when is the website live? Uh, well, the website's live now, but it's uh, it's just a Let's placeholder. Stop. Yeah. Um, so maybe a couple of weeks. Yeah, about like a, about one or two weeks, weeks. Probably by the end of the month, you'll see the website, and we'll have the ability to take orders online. Uh, bulk orders. Uh, we'll have a special uh, person dedicated to them if you want to buy a bunch of copies. So. So you want to? Yeah, do I can a give demo? a demonstration if you guys want to see uh, what it's all about. Um, let me uh, throw this up here. <coughs> Plugged in. Yep. Nothing. I'm trying. Yeah, that's what I hit. Pump F4. All right. Load this stuff here. Oh, looks like something's happening. Oh, I got the blinkies. Okay, there we go. Great. All right, I'm just gonna throw the program up. Uh, the installer is just sort of one-click, standard type of thing. Uh, it uses the WinPCAP driver uh, to do network sniffing, so you know, yeah, prompted to install that. Um, it's a uh, Visual Studio 2008 program, so you'll um, get a redistributable install when you when you do this. Um, it's an x86, x, uh, x86 program, so it's going to run in with uh, WOW64 or WOW32 or whatever it's called. Um, the uh, one of the new features is the ability to uh, analyze and dump hashes from. 64-bit uh, systems. Uh, this requires a bunch of different uh, techniques uh, in getting around things that uh, are put in place to, to I don't know. I mean, we, there are a lot of techniques for, for dumping hashes these days, and 64-bit uh, uh, just definitely threw a, a wrench in the old version. So um, the look and feel has been updated pretty significantly. Um, as you can see, it's got a, uh, a ribbon style interface. Uh, much like Office, it's got the black Office theme, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, wizards are all skinned and all that stuff, so you, uh, you know, have the standard assortment of dumping techniques. You can retrieve passwords from local machine, you hit next, you know, say I want to do a strong password audit. Um, and it goes right here, and you get to choose whether you want to see the hashes or you want to see this, the passwords when they're audited. We actually got that feature request from a big organization. They said, we love cracking passwords. We want to know when passwords can be cracked, but we don't want our admins to be able to see what the password is. <laughs> so they said, if you just had a checkbox which said, don't display the password once cracked, that will meet our criteria and we can use your tool. So I said, oh, OK, we'll add that, we'll add that feature if you <laughs> order a lot of copies. So um, it's optional. You can choose not to see the password. All right, I'll just import from the local machine. We'll hope that my passwords are secure in the box. Import. Well, I can see that I've got a, a user called monkey. I've got a user called administrator here. And there's some bugs, because it's, you know, it's, it's still a beta, but you can see there's some VMware users there. Uh, some of the users have empty uh, LM uh, passwords. Guest is disabled, but uh, has no password, apparently. Um, the land manager hash is missing for some of the accounts, specifically the service accounts. Um, but it is present for things that are administrative or local login. And that's just so people can log into their old Windows 95 boxes uh, 
and whatnot. So uh, you'll see we've added a progress meter. Um, and we've done all you this docking that. stuff that comes with the app, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, Do you so want yeah. a crack to show yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I'll just run a crack real quick. We have a little statistics bar on the side, as we've always had, that tells you where things are going, and a uh, sessions options mm -hmm. page that lets you choose what uh, dictionaries that you want to use, uh, whether you want to do hybrid cracking or not, um, or you want to use a rainbow table set, um, and the character sets used for brick force. Um, Those so are sort of set in the, 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 the order of, you know, of, uh, you know, complexity. Of, of, of the password. Um, and and see, you can see the, you know, the hybrid was always take dictionaries and then cycle some of the, ca some of the positions with random characters to try to get that you know, password one type of thing. But it, it's, it's, it's not intelligent. It's just prepend, postpend. Um, and you know, we'd like to make it more intelligent based on a, a rule set of, uh, of, of how human, human behavior um, deals with password constraints. Yeah. Hybrid cracking is, is, is pretty interesting. It also supports a lot of the weird things people do, like lead speak. You know, numbers changed on letters that look similar, uh, which is a homographic substitution for anybody really interested in this stuff. Um, the uh, crack NTLM password stuff comes from uh, the fact that NTLM uh, uppercases everything before it hashes it. So if you get the, NT the LM password cracked, um, it could be like foo, all capitals, but the NTLM password might be cash capital F, lowercase o, o. So we go through all of the capitalization substitutions to figure out what the NTLM password is once you've got the LM password. So those kinds of accelerations are uh, in, in place as well. Um, so we'll just hit OK here, and uh, we can go, and you'll see. <coughs> Again, beta. <laughs> Let's try this again. Uh, enjoy doing it live. I'm going to do it live. Don't click on the screen. Just hit. Yeah. Oh, there it's going. There we go. All right, so you see the uh, statistics going up here. Those are the dictionary crack that's being run. Well, you can see here that monkey, <laughs> monkey is nine characters ending with exclamation, exclamation, and administrator is eight characters ending in um, apostrophe. It's pretty hard to see there, but... Because the uh, one after hash is, hash is split up into seven characters and then another seven characters, um, you know, you get to get cracked the last half of the password, you know, at the same speed that you would be cracking the first half. Um, so making your password longer until it reaches like 16 or 15 or more characters uh, isn't actually meaning you anything. Yeah, until you get over 14. Right. Uh, characters. Right. Like, so, doesn't really um, matter. As the passwords be eventually get cracked, um, and you'll see the brute force attack is running there. Um, it takes a little while, uh, but you can see I'm getting a key right here, about 5 million keys a second. It's pretty quick for Land Manager because the hash is only executed once. Land Manager hash has got uh, a DES round on it. Um, and the NTLM stuff is MD4, single round, basically. Or maybe two rounds, but it's still small in comparison to uh, some of the Unix hashes. Um, I found recently it was the uh, SHA-256 and SHA-512 support was added. Mm -hmm. And we added Bluffish as well, so you can crack all of your ESD and latest Linux uh, Red Hat Enterprise systems. Um, that they took the SHA-2 algorithm for, say, the SHA-512 and did like a thousand rounds of that, which slows the hash down significantly and makes it harder to crack. Um, so you're going to divide it by a thousand. And the me mechanism for SHA is actually getting a little more complex anyway. So you know, longer crack times become more frustrating, but the uh, dictionary and hybrid attacks are still very valid. And uh, the brute force attack simply takes longer than you'd like to wait. But um, you know, a clever dictionary with clever uh, you know, human style hybrid attacks goes a long way and you get, you get a lot of the results anyway. Um, 
So yeah, it's going to take a little while to do the brute force here. I'm actually going to go through the whole thing because uh, it's going to take four hours. It'll go take but, four hours to push through the entire key space. But that's the entire key space for a landman in four hours now on modern, modern. modern uh, uh, and yeah. this is just a laptop. I mean, you'll find people doing uh, this kind of cracking on GPUs these days as well. Uh, we're considering doing that uh, in order to provide parallelism and, uh, and acceleration. Uh, Lovecrack has always been multi-threaded. Yeah, That's been a, one of the dual, benefits of it. Dual CPU, um, so you can, um, as, as you, you have like an eight CPU machine, you're going to get the benefit of that. I we also accelerated rainbow tables for using multi-core. So mm -hmm. rather than being heavily single-threaded like most rainbow, ta rainbow table implementations are, so it's multi-core. So you crack a lot of passwords for very quickly with the rainbow tables implementation. Um, so yeah, uh, it takes a little while, <laughs> so I'm just not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to go through some of the, some of the uh, other stuff here, just so you can see. There's a snipper. Uh, you click the snipper, and I'm going to go ahead and hit stop. Um, you can see there are network adapters, and you pick, you know. Do you want to do the Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi link. <laughs> you can say start snipping. And uh, you know, it'll sit around for a while, and if there are actual authentications happening, It'll eventually pick them up. I have no idea if we're actually going to get anything here, but uh, uh, this is the Starbucks module. <laughs> uh, <laughs> eventually, this will have the opportunity. To, this is where you're going to find the active injection stuff, um, where the challenge is actually actively modified as the authentication is being done. That way, uh, things can be cracked faster. Have you looked at SMB traffic, or have you looked at any actual models that? Uh, right now, it, it is specifically looking at SMB. Authentication, that's it right now. But there are other types of uh, NTLM SSP activity that would be worth sniffing, including exchange activity, RPC activity, that kind of stuff. That's all fair play, and uh, uh, we may add that eventually. So, um, yeah. But right now, SMP is kind of the, the thing. So, I may, I'm not going to sit around and uh, wait for that to happen, but the. Uh, Apparently, I have the schedule disabled because of the key that I generated for myself. Yeah, uh, you have the consultant have version. The, I don't have the, <laughs> the right version installed. Uh, the admin version has that, so I'd have to generate a key uh, for myself. I need to make a, a super duper key for myself or something. Uh, but yeah, you can see here that uh, you can select cracked accounts or weak passwords or expired accounts as they get cracked, and it'll select them in the, in the file list or the, the, the user list here. Um, there's a reporting feature. I believe that it's not working at the moment, um, but you'll see that on the reporting side, there's a bunch of pie charts and graphs about password strength and a um, bunch of um, analysis and averaging and things like that. So you can what? rate your passwords and things like that. But for some reason, again, my, my beta copy here is uh, still in beta. So. The, the thing you can do is you can import, and the scheduler does this, but you can actually import from many, many different machines and bring them into one cracking session. And then if you crack that password, it knows what machine you know, that came from. And if you want to do a password reset on that, it will go out to, to that machine. So the idea is there's efficiencies to doing many, you know, cracking the passwords from many, many different machines all at the same time. Um, so we take advantage of that with the scheduler. You go out and collect all your hashes and crack them all at, call, crack them all at once. Or you know, use rainbow tables or whatever. Right. Sure. Doesn't want people to see the passwords. You want to make sure that it's you. It's a great idea. You know, we should put this into the uh, the NT event logger and say, you know, as a security event, uh, that lock crack was fired up on the network yeah. and it was done by this user at this time, yeah. and that and passwords were cracked when they were, um, and that it was closed at a certain time. Yeah, auditing would be a great feature. Thanks for uh, suggesting that. We'll actually probably do it. Maybe we're going to be credited. Of course, we'll have a checkbox that says, don't, don't audit me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a good, uh, that's, a, that's a good one, especially for consultants, uh, because you want those people to leave a trail. You just do. You bring them into your network. You want them to leave a trail as they do their work. So yeah, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I, I wish I had more buttons to click and more little dialogues to show you, but uh, what it does is pretty straightforward. Um, the support for older uh, password file formats and things like that are are still in there, so you can import your old 
LC files if you want to for some reason, but importing new ones is generally a good idea on a regular basis. Um, PW dump uh, has been supplanted. Um, we are no longer using it directly. We actually have um, upgraded to uh, PizGigs FG dump. Um, you will find that that is a completely superior password dumping program. It's um, you know, amazingly well put together for what it does. Uh, it inc incorporates all the cache dump style functionality. Um, it is a GPL program. Um, we are shipping it as an executable along with the source, so you can play around with it. And you'll note that there are many other features in FGDump that are not um, you know, touched by Lovecraft specifically. If you want to use FGDump to generate a dump file and then feed it into Lovecraft, um, feel free to look through its copious amount of uh, command line options. You will find things for remotely disabling virus scanners other things because many times dumping passwords remotely these days causes a lot of red flags. If you actually want to uh, do it a little bit more quietly, you'll see that those options are still in there uh, if you do it from the demand line. So, any other questions? Well, thanks. Right. Thanks for coming. Visit the website in a few weeks, and uh, uh, if you want to participate in the beta, come see us, and we'll talk to you. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Good to see you. Okay. It's great. So it's the uh,